Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Zach DeBrine. I'm a part of the speaking team here at Encounter, and I have the pleasure of bringing God's Word to you guys this morning. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like when that intro video comes on, I should be like slow motion walking up these stairs with like a smoke machine coming out of the side and lights. Maybe like a dance crew can come in before me or something. At least I know you guys are all awake. You're all at least paying some attention right now, so I'm going to try to hold that as long as possible. This morning, we're going to be continuing and capping off the Twisted series. Uh, So this is a series that Dirk started quite a few weeks back when we look at verses that we tend to take out of context, that we tend to use the way we want them to be used. And Dirk's been talking about this idea of discovering the not-so-hidden truths about God's Word. So today, I'm going to be talking about one of those not-so-hidden truths, and that's in Philippians 4, verse 13. So I want you guys to just take a minute and think about where maybe you've seen that verse before, where you've heard it, what it means to you, how you've experienced it. Because this verse is a verse that's experienced not only inside of the church, but also outside of church walls. People know what Philippians 4.13 means, or at least they've seen the verse somewhere. And there's two people in particular that I feel like have kind of epitomized the use of this verse, and they're both athletes. And the first is Tim Tebow. I think I got a nice picture. Oh, yeah, look at that guy. So Tim is... I would say the personification of this Philippians 4.13 ideal. You know, he faces the day, he faces the game, he puts these things under his eyes, and he trudges forward. He's a Christian athlete, and he was very open about that. Maybe you know, like, the the Tebow thing that he was doing that was so controversial. He played in the NFL, and I think he's a minor league baseball player. Um, Another guy that comes to mind when I think of Philippians 4.13 is actually Steph Curry. He's an NBA point guard. Uh, He has a shoe brand and kind of like a whole clothing brand around this theme of 4.13. And Steph has also personified this idea of what it means to take this verse totally out of context and use it for your own means. But I'm not saying that these famous athletes are the only guys who do it, because I think I'm pretty much the poster boy for taking this verse out of context. Let me explain. I have always been an overachiever. I've always been the guy that tries way too hard. I've always been the keener. I know I'm that guy. I'm really sorry. But I've always been the kind of person who always gives 110% whether I'm at school, at my job, in my relationships, I always try to put my best foot forward. I kind of take Philippians 4.13 and use it as like a motto almost. And you know, this was on display just this past August when my wife and I moved here from Canada, the greatest country in the world. (laughs) And we, thank you, uh, we moved here. And I mean, there's a lot of news when you move, right? There's a new home, there's maybe a new community, there's a new, new family, there's new church, there's a new neighborhood, there's a new city, and we moved to a new country. And so that's a lot. That's a lot of news. That's a lot of change in a period of like a day. You're in Canada, and then you're in the States. And on top of that, I was going to school to be a seminarian, to do this. And we came over, and I decided, you know what, like I'm going to be a seminarian, so i got to take on more. All these news, this isn't enough. Philippians 4.13, right? And what I did is I took this verse and I decided that I was going to do exactly what it said. As you can see, I haven't told you what the verse said yet. And what I did was I signed up for as many things as I possibly could. So what this verse says is that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things. And I took this verse, much like Steph, much like Tim, very literally. And what I did was I signed up for three extra course credits in my first semester. I joined the chapel planning team at school. I got a job on campus. I started my internship here at Encounter. I preached. I preached and and taught in the youth. I became the organizer for the cafe team. I became the coordinator for the coffee team. And on top of that, this is the best part, on top of that, I said to myself, I'm going to join every single intramural team that Calvin has to offer because I have so much time on my hands. And if you ask my poor wife in that moment, like, where's your husband? I don't think she would have known because I would be busy every afternoon and every evening of the week. And you know what? Anytime that I had an open evening, I was supposed to be doing homework, the whole reason why I came here in the first place. So I had taken this idea that I can do all things through Christ to the extreme. You know, I really thought it meant that I can do all things. But the issue was is that I took this and I took it so far out of context that when I failed... And when I realized that I can't do it all, there's something wrong, there's something twisted in this verse. And I also, I don't think that I'm the only person here this morning who has been a bit overwhelmed with everything going on in their lives. I don't think I'm the only person here that takes on too much, that double books things, that that signs up for this and that and this and that, and then finds themselves overwhelmed with how busy they are. I don't think I'm the only one who sometimes uses this Philippians 4.13 or uses Jesus as a sort of motto. 
you know, as a sort of genie in a bottle, or like, like, or like Thor's hammer, you know, like when you're facing a difficult day or a difficult week, or you're facing a task, or you're, you're entering into maybe a game, maybe you're going to go play basketball and you really want to win. You know, you put on your Steph Curry's and you just get in there. But the reality is, is that this isn't what this verse is telling us. When in fact, Steph Curry, the same guy who made these shoes who I've referenced a few times, in 2015, after they won the NBA Finals, he actually tweeted the words, Philippians 4.13, just the words, Philippians 4.13. And that was retweeted and liked hundreds of thousands of times. And I don't think that was just in people who sit in church on a Sunday morning, because I feel like this idea that we can do all things is something that people grab hold of. Because everyone's so busy, because everyone's pursuing this Philippians 4.13 lifestyle in the hope that they will be content, in the hope that maybe they'll win the NBA Finals. I don't know. But we pursue this passionately. And seriously, maybe this morning you're here and you're a little bit burnt out by all this. Maybe you're a little bit like I was after that first semester of seminary. Maybe your week was so busy this week that the last thing you wanted to do this morning was come to church. You would have much rather just stayed in your pajamas and watch Netflix. And maybe you were completely overwhelmed with life. You know, for instance, maybe, maybe your work, you've been working so hard, you know, and they keep putting things on your table and on your desk, and you get them done, you get them done to the best of your ability, just to not get any recognition for it. You're not, you're not feeling fulfilled at work anymore. This goes for school, too. Maybe you've been studying so hard for your exams, and you've been studying to get that degree, but you feel like your parents don't understand how much work you're putting in. You feel like no one understands how much energy you're pouring into your studies, and you just don't feel fulfilled as a student. You know, maybe, maybe it's your relationships. You know, maybe you're here this morning, and things are a little bit rough with your husband or wife. Maybe they're a little bit rough with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, with your kids. And you just kind of, you're at the end of your rope. Because you are trying to do all things in order to make sure that, these th that this life is flourishing, that you're having a happy life. But it feels like every single time that you make it to the end, that you, that, you, that you come to the finish of what it looks like to do all these things, they come up short. And so maybe Philippians 4.13 this morning sounds pretty good to you. You know, maybe this idea that you actually can do all things and you can do it all because you have Jesus sounds pretty awesome. And I don't blame you. Because I think this idea that we can juggle all of life all at the same time is something that we hold very true. You know, you're juggling your work, you're juggling your friends, you're juggling your relationships, you're juggling your faith, you're juggling all these things all at once. You know, and you, you usually have time to like take a selfie so that you can convince everyone that your life is so perfect and you're so happy while you juggle all these things. But the reality is, is that as you juggle these things, there's going to be a point where you drop a ball or you drop all of the balls and you realize I can't do this. And Philippians 4.13 becomes a crutch for us in those moments. It becomes something that we can lean on and rely on. It becomes a justification for our crazy, busy lifestyles in pursuit of happiness, in pursuit of contentment, in pursuit of that job, in pursuit of that cottage someday or that car, in pursuit of the American dream. But there's going to be a moment when you realize, I can't do it all, just like I did last semester. Because I can't do it all, because you can't do it all, because we can't do it all. So we're going to turn to the Word this morning. There's going to be some Bibles in the chairs in front of you. Uh, if you like those better than yours or you don't have one, please take that home with you. We're going to be looking at Philippians 4, starting in verse 11. That's going to be on page 820. A couple things before we get right to the verse. The first is that I actually planned this whole sermon around the ESV the NIV is going to be in front of you, so if you think I'm like making up tr a translation as I go, the words up front will match what I'm saying. So just keep that in mind. And the other thing that I think we need to do is we need to do some context. We need to understand what Paul is saying and who he's saying it to and who Paul is for the first place. So today we're going to be looking at the book of Philippians. Philippians is a letter written by a man named Paul. Paul was an apostle. So he was a man of God. He was a church planter. He was, he was a missionary, essentially. And what he did is he went from place to place planting churches and telling the good news of Jesus. And the Philippians are the people in which he is writing this letter to today. And they're like his, his crown jewel. Like he is so proud of these people. They've really took what it means to follow Jesus to heart. And so he's writing to them today, but he's writing to them from the confines of a jail cell. Because this passion that he has to share the gospel, to share the word, is actually being persecuted by the government, by the Romans. 
So he's been arrested, and he's sitting in a dark, musty jail cell, probably hungry, not many clothes on his back, probably a little bit miserable. And he's writing a letter to a church that he has planted, that he had a great relationship with. And the reason why he's writing this letter, the reason why, at least in our chapter today, he's writing to the Philippians is he's telling them that he doesn't need any help. And he's telling them this because in the past, the Philippians had given him finances, they'd given him some materials, they've given him some food and some clothes for his back. Think of like a church commissioning a missionary. You know, Paul was their missionary. And so he's writing to them and telling them, I don't need any material wealth, I don't need any help, I'm fine right where I am. And so let's turn to Philippians 4, verse 11. This is where we're going to start today. Keep in mind, Paul's in jail, Philippians are the church that he planted, he's writing to these people. And Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. Now, if you're like me, and if you remember what I just told you, that Paul's in jail, and you read this verse, and Paul's saying, I've learned to be content in whatever situation. When I read this, I'm like, what, Paul? Are you kidding me? How are you possibly content right now? You realize that you're probably smelly, you're probably hungry, you're probably cold, and you're in jail. And you're telling me that you're content. You know, if if I was Paul writing to the Philippians in this moment, I would have been like, dear Philippians, get me out of here. I'm hungry and I'm cold and I need some help. But Paul writes that he has learned to be content in whatever situation. And I think that this catches our attention because contentment I believe, is the reason why we're so busy. Our desire for contentment drives this all-things lifestyle. Our desire to be happy, our desire maybe to win the NBA Finals, our desire to live a life that's successful. And so this idea of being content in whatever situation just does not make sense to us. It doesn't. But Paul today is telling us that he's learned how to be content in whatever situation. Now, in verse 12, he elaborates a little bit deeper, and he says, In every, any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Now, this is where it gets pretty real, because Paul isn't only saying that he's learned to be content, because you know those people who are just like, they're, just, they're always kicking back. Whatever you want to do, yeah, that's fine. Oh, you want to do this? Oh, yeah, that's fine. You want this for dinner? Yeah, that's fine. They're just relaxed. They're genuinely, they're fine with whatever circumstance. But Paul is saying that he's actually learned a secret. He's learned something that allows him to be content regardless of what life brings him, regardless of the fact that he's juggling too many things at once and he's fallen, and now he's in a jail cell. And he's telling us that there is something, there's some kind of secret that brings him that joy. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this sounds, now this is getting pretty interesting. Because if there's a secret to joy, that means that we don't need to live this all things lifestyle anymore, does it? That that means that we don't need to juggle our jobs and our wives. We don't need to juggle everything that's going on in our lives all at once in pursuit of that contentment or pursuit of that happiness. There's just a secret that Paul knows. So if Paul could tell us that secret, that would be great. And we can just kind of go back toward that secret instead. But I have a bit of a spoiler alert for you guys. Uh, The secret is actually what I've been talking about the whole time since I've been up here. The secret is actually the verse that's on your handout. The secret is actually what I've been saying we've been interpreting wrong this entire time. And the secret, he goes on in verse 4, verse 13. The secret that Paul has for the Philippians is that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And now you guys are just pretty much upset with me because I came up here and I told you that this is wrong. This is not the way that we should be living our lives. That the way that we interpret Paul is incorrect. But now Paul is telling us that the way to be happy is just to be able to do everything. But what I'm here today to help you guys understand is that we have twisted and turned this verse into something that it is not. Because in fact, what Paul is talking about is not our capacity to do everything but our ability to remain content in those moments in life where we've dropped all the balls we've been juggling and we're down and out, we are miserable. Paul is actually saying to us not to fill our plate with more things to do, but to be content when our plate is empty, to find joy in those moments where everything that we've tried has failed, to find contentment when work is going miserably, our kids are being menaces, when our school, we're failing in school, 
When everything that we seem to desire and work towards, when we get there, it shows to be empty. Paul is telling us not that we need to do more and that maybe if we do a little bit more and a little bit more, eventually we'll get there. Paul is telling us that in those moments when we failed and we failed miserably, that we have a God who gives us contentment and that we should focus on contentment in all things. So I think it's easy at this point to really feel as though I'm pretty much just bringing this verse completely out of context. Because when we read the words, it, Paul's clearly saying something different than, I've learned to be happy in Jesus when everything goes wrong. Because he could probably say that. But in fact, what I am saying today, I think is best described by going to the original language. I have a little point in my notes that says, hold for applause, because I know you're all going to get really excited when we talk about Greek. But today, I think that it's, this is really easy, I promise. When we look at the verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I want to look at the word through. So this word through, when you have the idea of through, that means like going through something to get where, somewhere, using something to get through to something. And the word through in the Greek is the word N. Picture the letter E and the letter V. And most basically, this word actually means in. So I kind of want to just like bring back the translation and make it as bare bones as possible. And I believe that this will help us understand what Paul's really trying to tell us in Philippians 4.13. And so I think I got a different slide up here in which I use a different translation that I've kind of used through the Greek, which says, I can do all things in the one who strengthens me. I can do all things in Christ. So I want to give you guys just a minute to think about if that means anything to you, first of all, if, that, if that's ringing any bells, if that's really starting to make a little bit of sense. But I also want to give us a little bit of a picture to help us understand where I'm going. So picture you have two families. You know, you got the Davidsons and you got the Johnsons. They're both from Michigan and they both go to Florida on vacation. So the Davidsons are the kind of family, much like my family, who they wake up at like 4 o'clock in the morning, they get on the road, they don't stop to go to the bathroom, they don't even look out the windows, they're just driving down that highway because they want to get their toes in the sand, they want to hold something in their hand, and they want to enjoy their vacation. And that's what they're going to do. So they're going through every state, without looking back, without looking side to side, they just want to get to that goal. And then you have the Johnsons, and the Johnsons are a little bit more relaxed. And in fact, they think that it's exciting to spend time in each state on the way down. You know, seeing the sights, hearing the sounds, smelling the scents, enjoying what each state has to offer, learning about those states, participating in that state. Because they believe that it's, it's the journey to get there. They're still going to get there. They're still going to get their feet in the sand and a cold drink in their hand. They know that that's going to happen, but they understand how important it is to just spend time in each of these states because a vacation could happen anywhere along the way. And so with this idea of through and this idea of in, Let's bring that back to the verse now. Let's bring that back to what we're talking about with Paul talking about contentment and us talking about doing too many things at once. Because I think this idea of through uses Christ a little bit. You know, we use Christ as a highway to get to where we want to go. So this idea of doing all things through Christ, the reason why we've misinterpreted it is because we're so busy juggling everything at once, trying to get to that point that we believe will bring us happiness, and we're kind of, we kind of ask Christ to join us on that journey. Like, we're already halfway there. Maybe something goes wrong. I'm like, Jesus, give me strength to continue going to where I want to go. Well, this idea of being in Christ, of dwelling with Christ, of getting to know Jesus, of spending time with him, allows us to get to know Jesus and for him to direct our paths. Finding strength in Jesus is much different than finding our own strength to do our own thing and then asking Jesus to join us. But living in him and seeking him and seeking his will and his desire, maybe he's not actually going to lead us over there. He's going to lead us over here or over here or over here or to something that we didn't even know was a desire of our heart because he knows us personally because we can do all things in the one who strengthens me. Because Jesus helps us find contentment when we've made it to this point and we realize that this is empty when we've made it to this point, juggling everything at once, and we get there, and we look back, and we realize that we left Jesus in the behind. But if we start by dwelling in him, if we start by coming to church and participating in small groups and finding community and seeking places to pray and finding those opportunities to take our faith more seriously, 
or take those decisions more seriously and realize that it's not actually about us doing everything trying to get somewhere, but it's about participating in Jesus and realizing that he has a plan for us and seeking that plan. So there's a man by the name of Millard Fuller who I would consider to be a Philippians 4.13 guy in the basic sense when we first started. You know, he was an overachiever. He's the kind of guy who desired success. And he had an idea. He had an end goal. He had something that he saw in his sights and he wasn't going to stop at anything to get there. He was a Christian. He believed that God would give him the strength to do so. And on his journey, he picked up more and more balls, and he was juggling his faith, he was juggling his work, he was juggling his relationships, he was juggling his passions. And then he arrived at that place that he desired. He arrived at that place that he thought would bring him success. He became a multimillionaire at the age of 26. By the world's standards, he was doing everything right. But then there was a moment when he dropped all the balls, when life hit him hard, when he found himself in a jail cell, much like Paul. And he turned back and he looked on the highway where he came from and he realized that he left his relationship with his wife, his kids, his job, people in the path that he walked over to get to this goal. Because he was trying to do all things, because he was desiring to do all things, because he felt that that was what God had called him to. And as he looked back, he realized he can't do all things. And in fact, he realized that God does not call us to all things. He calls us to one thing. He calls us to him. And so Millard Fuller, he lost everything. He experienced Jesus once again. And he realized that God does not call him to all of these things. God calls him to one thing. God calls him to him. And from there, his paths will be directed. And so in an epiphanic moment when he just experienced the Spirit and he really just felt like, God, use me for something. I know this is empty. I'm sorry for what I've done. And God began to bring him back to him. And along his way, his marriage got rekindled and his kids came back to him. And he just felt this call in his life to give away all his possessions. So him and his family, that's what they did. They gave away everything that they had. And what they did with that money is they started an organization, an organization that's built almost a million homes today. And Habitat for Humanity is still around today, and it's still doing good work, and it's still creating high-cost homes for low-cost prices. You know, and Millard realized when he got here everything that he had left behind. He had realized that he was not dwelling in Christ, that he was not finding the strength to do all things, to be content in all things through Christ, but that he was using Christ as a highway to get to where he wanted by using his strength. Much like I did when I first moved here. Much like maybe you this morning in your work. Because we don't have a God who sits above us and demands that we do things. We have a God who sent his son Jesus to dwell with us. And from Jesus, we can do all things. We can be content in all things. There's one more thing, I think it's on your sheet here, that I just want, I want to talk about and I want to point out as we bring it to a close here. And that's the fact that, much like Muller, uh, Fuller, when we try to do it all, we lose sight of the fact that God has already given us his all. When we try to do it all, when we try to juggle everything at once, going toward what we desire in our own strength, we lose sight of the fact that God has already given us his all. That God has given us his all in Jesus. That our desire for contentment, our desire for, for fulfillment will never happen over here. It will only happen when we go to board and dwell in Jesus. And from there, we can live our lives. When we try to do it all, we lose sight of the fact that God has already given us all. So I don't know where you are at this morning. I don't know if you feel like you're trying to juggle everything at once and you're trying to get to some point somewhere that will give you joy. I don't know if Jesus is a part of that picture. I don't know if he has been a part of that picture. I don't know if he will be a part of that picture. But wherever you are, I hope and I desire and I pray that today you would realize that your faith, that this life isn't about trying to do everything all at once. 
We're not called to do all things. We're called to one thing. We're called to Jesus. We're called to him. And from there, we can move forward. And this, friends, is the secret. This is the secret Paul's talking about in this verse. The secret is Jesus. And I know it kind of sounds like a Sunday school answer. But that is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the fact that Jesus gives him the strength to be content when life is going all of the wrong ways. Jesus gave Fuller the strength when he made it to that place that he thought would be fulfilling. It was completely empty. Jesus gives us the strength to be content when life isn't going the way that we want it to. That is what Philippians 4.13 is saying. That is what Paul is saying to the Philippian church from the confines of a jail cell, that he is content because he has Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the all that we should be working toward. Because Jesus Christ is the one in whom all things come together. And as we go from this place, as we think about these things, I just hope and I pray that you would take that seriously. That you'd realize that the secret to that contentment that you're pursuing through your work or your school or your relationships or your extracurriculars or your 50 other things like I was, that the answer to that contentment and that joy is by dwelling in him and allowing him to direct your paths as opposed to going down your paths and asking him to join you later. Because God does not call us to all things. God calls us to one thing. God calls us to him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that even though we get so busy, even though we get so concerned with the things of this world, even though we get so caught up in our own selfish desires, that you know us, that you journey with us. Father God, I just ask and I pray that for all of those who are here today who are feeling overwhelmed and overburdened, for all of those who are here today who just feel like life has gotten them down, for all of those who feel like they've been trying to do all things for much too long, I just pray that your spirit would convict them, that your spirit would lead them back to you. Your spirit would lead them to the cross, to Jesus. We just thank you for this opportunity today. We pray that as we go from this place, that we would do so in your strength, that we'd learn to be content in every moment of every day. That regardless of where life takes us, regardless of the dark jail cells that we may feel that we're in, that you, Jesus, give us the strength to seek contentment in it all. So we just thank you. We love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.